Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to another Think Tank hosted by Academis, of course, once again, uh, affiliated with the Classical Association. Tonight, we'll be discussing Greek theatre, a somewhat appropriate event following on from Paul Cartledge and Nicholas Stone's discussion on Thebes and its mythic foundations. Uh, before we get started, as always, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, as we've moved on from the Zoom, uh, we've now moved on to Zoom webinar. Uh, this means that if you'd like to ask any questions, uh, please use the Q&A function that you have there for you. Um, try and avoid using the chat function just so we can have all the questions collected into one single box. Um, the Q&A will function as follows. Um, Daisy will be talking to us uh, for approximately 45 minutes and then we're going to have a five minute break so you can collect your questions and then we'll go on for 15 minutes of Q&A. So we'll get down to your questions at the very end of this evening's talk. Um, Dr. Daisy Dunn is a fantastic uh, writer, classicist and cultural critic. Uh, she has represented her former Oxford College and held uh, at the 2016 University College, uh, the University Challenge uh, for the Christmas special. She's presented to the BBC. Uh, she's been on LBC, talk radio and amongst other recording studios. She is uh, a wonderful classicist and we're very lucky to have her tonight. And before we move on to Daisy's talk, I'd like to hand over Philippa for a few words. Hi there, everyone. Um, I'm Philippa. I'm the Business Development Director at Academis. And I'd just like to again thank you all for joining us tonight. It's really exciting um, to be joined by Daisy and we're so thrilled to have you here. But I think that's everything from me. I think I'll hand back over to AJ and Daisy and we'll get started. Cheers, Philippa. Uh, one more note to have, if you're going to, if you find at the end of tonight's talk you've enjoyed uh, listening to Dr. Daisy Dunn, uh, you can of course pick up her very recent book of Gods and Men, A Hundred Stories from Greece and Rome. It's a really fantastic book and it looks through the reception studies of all these myths that have come down to us from antiquity, from the works uh, and epics of Homer and Hesiod, uh, from uh, Herodotus, Xenophon, Livy, uh, Suetonius, Plutarch, the tragedies of Aeschylus, Euripides and Sophocles up until the, the, the sort of the cusp of the modern era with Christian writers. It's really a fantastic book. It really looks into the various authors that have translated these works uh, throughout history, um, including Queen Elizabeth I, Percy Bysshe Shelley, Walter Pater, Lawrence of Arabia and Ted Hughes and Walter Raleigh, some really prominent figures throughout history. So if you find yourself uh, looking for more uh, materials from Dr. Daisy Dunn, please have a look for her book. We'll post links to that towards the chat. And without further ado, I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Daisy Dunn. Over to you, Daisy. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm thrilled to be here uh, this evening and thank you all very, very much for, for joining me. Uh, I thought, seeing as none of us can actually go to the theatre, at the moment, I might take you there in spirit, uh, specifically to the great theatre festival of ancient Athens, which was known as the City Dionysia. Um, this was an enormous gathering held in honour of Dionysus, the patron god of theatre. And quite fittingly for us, it took place um, in March. Uh, so we're, we're right on time. So we'll pretend that this festival started this morning. Uh, we'd have got up really quite early, we'd have put on our warmest cloaks and coverings and we'd have followed the crowd of people towards the Acropolis. And we might have been a little bit um, bleary eyed, shall we say, because last night we'd have joined a massive procession as it snaked through the city with people pouring in from all around and offering up bread and various gifts to Dionysus, a sort of a cult image uh, of the god. Uh, after that, there was a huge sacrifice. So we'd have had lots and lots of meat, lots of wine, lots of dancing, generally lots of fun. So we might be a little bit tired today as we head off to the theatre. Dionysus, as I said, he's the god of the theatre, but also, of course, he's the god of, of wine and revelry. And in Greek, we sometimes speak of him as Lysios, which means he's the releaser. He's the god who really encourages us to let our hair down as much as possible. So that's what I'm hoping we're going to be doing uh, this evening. Um, because this is his, his spring festival, there'll be absolutely no work today whatsoever. All the businesses are closed, even the law courts are closed. This is all very much in his honour. 
So as we make our way to the Great Theatre of Dionysus, which is located on the southeast slope of the Acropolis, we'll find ourselves sandwiched between about 15,000 other spectators. So it's quite a large crowd. Um, I have to apologise, I say ladies, we are very much in the minority uh, if we're sort of strictly there at all. And um, we're not sure that women were really there. I mean, Plato gives an indication that um, women were in the audience. And there's another reference to uh, women sort of being able to pick up the last tickets available for the night. But we're sort of not priority guests, unfortunately. But I think for me, uh, of course, you will be. Um, <laughs> so... When we're talking about a Greek theatre, and we're talking about the, the theatre of Dionysus, very little of the actual theatre of the fifth century that we're talking about this evening actually survives. But we're generally talking about a D-shaped auditorium. We're not talking about an amphitheatre, which is a form of two halves of those. They're not sort of talking about a theatre in the round. We're talking about a D-shaped auditorium. Um, and we'll sort of be sitting down uh, sort of in our sort of wooden benches uh, to watch what's going on. And we'll see very early on a parade of young boys brought before us. And these are boys who would have received their education uh, at the expense of this of um, the state itself because sadly they'd have lost their, their fathers in battle. So this is kind of a, a sort of diplomatic thing because we'll see in the sort of front row a whole load of dignitaries from other Greek city states. And they're sort of looking on very impressed by, by all of this. First off, in the order of running of things, would be treated to some comedy. Um, but I want to fast forward a few minutes and take you to what's probably going to be the highlight of this year's festival, or this evening uh, at least, which is a performance um, about our patron god himself, uh, the Bacchae by Dionysus. And Bacchus, of course, is the Latin name for, for, for Dionysus, the same god. In this play, um, fitting sort of quite nicely, leading on from, from Paul Cartledge's talk, which I think some of you would have seen recently, uh, the god introduces uh, his cult to the Greek city of Thebes, where his mortal cousin, Pentheus, is now king. And Pentheus just doesn't know what to do when this happens. And it's difficult to try and think of a, sort of a modern analogy for this, but I was thinking about this earlier, I was thinking, what is a good analogy? You know, I could only come up with sort of a, a crowd of, sort of hippies descending upon Buckingham Palace. That's a bit sort of how, how Pentheus feels when he sees a sort of crowd uh, of, of, sort of Dionysiac followers coming towards him. He just doesn't really know what to do about it. And um, he's initially, um, Dionysus comes in disguised as a follower of Dionysus, so a follower of himself, so to speak. And what he does is he drives the women of Thebes into the mountains and kind of makes them sort of inspires them sort of a, a divine form of, of madness. And Pentheus, the king, even though he's very young, he's an incredibly conservative figure. And he is really anxious by what he sees. And he's, he's desperate really to, to stamp out all of this madness as quickly as possible before it gets out of hand. At the same time, there's a little bit of him that's more than a little bit curious about what this madness might inspire. And particularly, he, he kind of suspects there's gonna be a lot of, sort of wild orgies and he kind of wants to take a little look at what's going on. So in sort of quite an amusing episode, you have Dionysus incognito helping Pentheus up a tree so that he can actually spy on all the events taking place below. Uh, and a messenger, in the play describes what happens um, as Dionysus did the following. I'll just read you a little bit from, from the play. And this is from William Arrowsmith's translation from 1919. Reaching for the highest branch of a great fir, he bent it down, down, down to the dark earth, till it was curved the way a taut bow bends, or like a rim of wood when forced about the circle of a wheel. Like that, he forced that mountain fir down to the ground. No mortal could have done it. Then he seated Pentheus at the highest tip and with his hands let the trunk rise straightly up, slowly and gently, lest it throw its rider. And the tree rose, towering to heaven, with my master huddled at the top. And now the Minads, the followers of Dionysus, saw him more clearly than he saw them. 
but barely had they seen when the stranger vanished and there came a great voice out of heaven. Dionysus says it must have been, crying, women, I bring you the man who has mocked at you and me and at our holy mysteries. Take vengeance upon him. So I think this one is one of my favourite images um, when it comes to this play. I think I love the idea of the gods of catapulting this rather po-faced king up um, into the sky on, on, a, on a branch of a tree. Um, in the, the, the ensuing episode, we see poor Pentheus actually be torn apart by his own mother who mistakes him for a lion. And there's a very sort of graphic description of her and the other women playing um, ball with scraps of his flesh. Um, quite disgusting. Uh, on a really sort of basic level, um, we have sort of in this play representation of the sort of two sides of the human psyche. You've got this kind of Dionysian wildness, which is supposed to be sort of inherent in all of us, um, surrounded by this kind of outer shell of propriety represented by Pentheus. And really the tragedy is staging um, a sort of tussle between the two. And what Euripides seems to sort of be telling us is that in this fight between the two, it's always the wildness that will, will come out and sort of get the, 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 the higher hand, um, the better hand in this. It will always sort of be victorious. It's no matter how hard you try to try and sort of quash this wildness. There's, there's no way that you can actually succeed in doing that. Uh, Euripides was the youngest of the three great tragedians of the fifth century BC. Um, he was said to be the son of a greengrocer, and a bit like with um, with Margaret Thatcher, people were a little bit snobbish um, about that uh, at that time, and they also seem to have found him slightly more uh, sort of brazen, sort of shocking and, and, and controversial than Aeschylus and Sophocles, who are the other two main playwrights of the period. Uh, each of these men would put on three tragedies at the, the festival, followed by a satire play. And I say satire, not satire. This was a kind of a, a short, kind of bawdy, quite slapstick um, affair. And unfortunately, we've only got one that's actually survived, which is by Euripides. And that was kind of rounded off at the end of the evening. So people would go home feeling a little bit better about themselves after sort of all the heaviness of the tragedy and all the, the sort of disasters that, that were sort of presented on, on stage. Uh, and these plays were, were judged as part of a group. Um, so uh, what we found is that the Aeschylus and Sophocles um, consistently won more prizes than poor old Euripides. But that didn't stop Euripides from trying. And actually his Bacchae, which was performed actually a short time after he died, uh, took first prize. So I think it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's strangely comical in many ways for a tragedy, but it had a valuable moral message at the heart of it, like many of these plays or all of these plays rather do, uh, which is whatever you do, do not dishonor the gods. So the gods really are everywhere in the Greek plays. Um, we find sort of statues of them on street corners. We find them being worshipped to uh, with sort of great sacrifices and uh, all these sort of lovely altars. And we find the gods appear above the stage itself um, in kind of a, a crane-like contraption. Uh, many of you would have heard the phrase deus ex machina, which is sort of a Latin phrase, literally meaning a god from a machine, but it refers to the use of a specific kind of scaffold uh, so that uh, the, the sort of the gods could be carried on to sort of resolve the play, uh, resolve the plot uh, at the end. Uh, the gods are sort of ever present really. They're even present in descriptions you find, really beautiful descriptions uh, of sort of the coming of day and uh, of, of night as well. I think one of the descriptions I, I really like particularly is uh, in Aeschylus's Persians, as uh, a description of divine day cantering forth on her white steed and dazzling the earth below. Uh, I recently um, put together a, an anthology of, of, of plays and also to sort of stories from all kinds of different genres of, of Greek and Latin literature, uh, which I'm sort of reading from partly this evening. Um, uh, AJ was kind enough to, to mention earlier. And um, really this was a sort of inspired by the books that I really enjoyed reading uh, as 
uh, a young child, I used to love all these sort of compilations, retelling stories of, of Narcissus and the Cyclops and uh, the Trojan horse, all these wonderful tales. Um, but it was only when I was a little bit older that I realized that all of these stories, which I'd enjoyed so much as a child, actually bore very little resemblance to many of the original texts, which the, the Greeks and Romans enjoyed. So what I really wanted to do was to put together a book um, of these stories, but actually translated from the original text. And what really surprised me is sort of the, the huge range of people who had been so interested enough to, you know, to, to translate these works. They've been absolutely taken with these stories in the same way that I was. You sort of mentioned earlier so Elizabeth I, for example, I had no idea that she translated so many works of, of classical literature. Um, so I found that sort of a really interesting process uh, to sort of put together a hundred stories based on uh, the viewpoints of all these different different people. And what really struck me most when I when I was assembling uh, this book was how pivotal the relationship between men and gods really is, particularly in Greek tragedy. Uh, as I assembled almost of a hundred stories uh, in the English translations that I like most, I realized how often the gods actually serve as the catalysts of the drama. Um, I think this is sort of true more or less of, of all of the, the plays that I looked at. I, sort of, I was really taken with the idea that, that the fact that the gods are very much the architects of men's fates in all of these plays. They can make things absolutely dire and terrible uh, for men, but they can also raise people up and then receive sort of due thanks for, for doing so. But a lot of the time, actually, in, in the tragedies in particular, you find the gods being blamed or at least implicated in the fates of men when things go really, really badly wrong. So if I turn uh, for a moment to another of Euripides' plays, another of my favourite plays, actually, which is the Hippolytus. Uh, in this play, we meet a woman named Phaedra, and she's the wife of the king of Athens. And she's in an absolutely terrible state when we first encounter her in this play. She's, she's lying in bed, she's refusing food, and she's really hoping to die. She's given up. Uh, every Greek tragedy had a chorus, um, sort of a, a band of usually 12 or 15 different people who are sort of go-betweens between uh, the, the audience and the actors. Uh, they sort of communicate with the main cast on behalf of Athens itself, while also sort of addressing really quite poetic um, sort of often moral statements and sentiments to the audience as well. And in Hippolytus, this chorus is made up of Greek women. And they ask, they approach Phaedra and they ask, what, you know, what on earth is wrong? What's wrong with you? Uh, so if I read again from uh, a translation, is it a God inside you girl, they ask, deranged by Pan, by Heracles, sorry, not Heracles, Hecate, or the holy mountain mother, or does Artemis, mistress of wild things, devastate you? Or is it your husband, the king of Athens, the highborn one? Is someone in your house coaxing him to secret sex? Or has some sailor out from Crete brought the queen harsh news? That's quite a sort of a modern, it's a lovely translation actually by uh, a contemporary Canadian poet called Anne Carson. Uh, and I think the really striking thing uh, when I still see that as sort of the order of questioning yeah, is, is sort of the, 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 the order in which these ideas come to them, the, the assumptions that these women have. And the very first thought they have uh, is, has a god interfered with Phaedra in some way? Is that why she is in bed and she's weeping and she's just refusing all food? The second thought is, uh, is her husband having an affair? And only then does it occur to them that, oh, maybe she's just had some terrible news that day. Um, so the, you know, the, the, the divine explanation is right up top. Uh, and they're right. Uh, it is uh, partly or largely to do with um, a deity that, that Phaedra is in this state. Aphrodite, the great goddess of love and lust, uh, has made Phaedra fall painfully in, in lust, really is the word, with her stepson, Hippolytus, um, because Hippolytus refuses to worship Aphrodite. And he's a young man, but like Pentheus, he's a slightly odd one. Uh, he, he lives only for, for horses, uh, really. His, he absolutely hates sex. He hates anything to do with relationships. He, he lives for his horses. And his name actually comes from the Greek for horse, hippos, and the Greek verb luo, uh, which means to loosen. And the significance of that becomes apparent later in the play. 
His servant gives Hippolytus a warning. He says, to honour God's child is an obligation. You can, by all means, you can have your favourite God. You can have gods that you respect, particularly because their attributes um, chime with your own interests. But what, what you mustn't do is willfully neglect one of the Olympian gods surrounding Zeus. And that's what Hippolytus is doing by ignoring Aphrodite. So she casts her spell uh, to punish him. And poor Phaedra, she's really just collateral in all of this. So I think our sympathies are with her um, from quite early on in the play. Now, Anne Carson, uh, the translator who I'm still reading from at the moment, she decided to retain the Greek of many of the emotional outbursts in the play. So we find wonderful things uh, in her translation. So you, you sort of hear all these, these words, oi moi, ai ai, which give you, gives you a really good sense, I think, of the elevated uh, sort of emotional level which was experienced in the Greek festival itself. As you sit down on your rather hard, um, originally wooden bench uh, in this theatre, the air above you would really very much be vibrating with sound. Um, the rhythm and the sound of the choral odes were particularly, particularly strong. And the, the chorus was actually, while they're reciting, they'd be dancing and they'd be sort of accompanied by music as well. And they were performing on a big round platform, which was placed between the stage and the audience. And it was known as the orchestra, hence the presence and sort of the layout of the, the orchestra in modern theatres today. And what I think was really interesting when you're reading any of these plays is to bear in mind that on the stage itself, there are just three actors. And I think that's really surprising when you read these plays as text, you think you've got this enormous cast a lot of the time, but actually you don't, you've got all the parts being played by just three. Uh, all of them are men and they're, they're covering all these different parts and they'd have been wearing masks to differentiate uh, their different uh, pass, parts in this. And they'd have sort of very, very lavish, often sort of built in wigs as well. So they don't look quite a sight. So, this is something I think you should really bear in mind when we think of, of Phaedra weeping in her bed. Um, we, we shouldn't be picturing a sort of a, a woman there sitting there in her nightie by any means. What we're picturing is a man dressed up as a woman with a mask showing her sorrow uh, in a very, very expressive way. So it has a completely different feel to sort of how uh, you sort of might imagine it uh, when you're actually reading the text itself. So we have poor Phaedra lying there and she eventually tells her nurse how she's feeling and she she's eventually says uh, admits to her feelings for her stepson Hippolytus and she swears her to secrecy. Unfortunately the nurse can't help herself so it's only so long before Hippolytus finds out how Pyge is really feeling about him and he is absolutely disgusted by this and he threatens to tell his father about it. Out of shame, Phaedra then decides to commit suicide, um, but she doesn't want to leave this world behind with everyone thinking that she was disgusting in any way. So what she does is to um, write, she, sort of, she writes something, a message on, on a tablet and as she's dying, um, she's clasping this tablet. And the tablet contains a note and this note claims that Hippolytus has raped her which obviously isn't true. So naturally, Hippolytus' father is absolutely outraged when he discovers this and absolutely distraught by it. Um, and he refuses to believe Hippolytus' pleas of innocence and is sort of begging to be sort of forgiven and sort of being brought back into his fold. Um, so instead, he's sort of threatened with being exiled from the city. Before that can happen, though, uh, Hippolytus' horses rear just as he's riding near the coast um, and Theseus' his father has actually implored Poseidon, the great god of the sea, to punish him and the god sends up a, a sea monster which drives Hippolytus' horses onto the rocks and he's gravely injured as a result of that accident. And the chaste goddess Artemis, um, who Hippolytus has revered all through his life because he loves hunting and he loves all the things that she represents, she actually tells Theseus the truth. And Hippolytus lives just long enough um, for, for uh, his father to forgive him. So in a sense, it's not sort of as, quite as tragic as it could have been, but it's, it's a pretty bad state of affairs. The play above all provided a lesson in honoring the gods. Um, 
the idea is if you scorn them, they will take revenge and meddle in your life. Um, but I think I, I, I think probably quite a lot of you will be with me with this. You'll be sort of be pitying Phaedra quite a lot in this play. I mean, it was absolutely terrible for her to write that note accusing Hippolytus of doing uh, what she did. Um, but what has she done to deserve this in the first place? Um, I think so the question is, why should she suffer when really Aphrodite only wanted to punish Hippolytus? The problem for Phaedra is her family history. Uh, you can have characters in Greek myth who are subject to something a bit like a family curse. Um, so sort of bad luck runs through their blood and they have to fulfill their fate and sort of pay penance for the crimes of their ancestors. And poor Phaedra had that in spades. Her father was King Minos of Crete. Uh, her mother was Pasiphae. And in the famous story, of course, Poseidon uh, made Pasiphae develop a crush on a bull. And in her desperation, she hired Daedalus, the great master craftsman, to sort of somehow make her up as a cow so that she could mate with this bull. It was all very, very dysfunctional. And the result of that encounter was the Minotaur. Uh, Phaedra's sister, Ariadne, actually helped Theseus to navigate the labyrinth to go and kill the Minotaur, only to be abandoned by him, having fallen deeply in love with him. And so she was, um, you know, another victim and Phaedra's yet another victim uh, of this family's bad luck. So really, when you're looking at Greek tragedy, um, steady good fortune is really the very best that you can hope for. Um, as Oedipus said, and I, lo I love this uh, in the, the translation of the, the Irish poet W.B. Yeats, Oedipus says, I think myself the child of good luck and that the years are my foster brothers. Sometimes they have set me up and sometimes thrown me down, but he that has good luck for mother can suffer no dishonour. Oedipus himself is, of course, uh, an interesting case, if you put it that way. Uh, in Sophocles' Oedipus Rex, he's forced to confront the truth of a terrible oracle. And this oracle told him that he would kill his father, father and sleep with his mother. And he fled town in order to try and avoid this horrible thing from happening. The trouble for Oedipus is that his parents are not who he thinks they are. The, the Greeks, um, really believe that oracles were a bit like dreams, the one way through which the gods can communicate with mortals. Um, but divine prophecies, and particularly oracles, were notoriously tricky and ambiguous and often so very, very difficult to read the right way. And it, it really it says a lot about how the gods viewed their relationship with mortals, that they should issue such ambiguous oracles. It's almost like they're saying, don't say we didn't warn you while giving them the most sort of confusing advice possible, which could easily be misinterpreted, which is of course what happens and fuels a lot of these tragedies, including Oedipus Rex. Um, on his way back from consulting this particular oracle, Oedipus got into a scuffle at some crossroads and killed a carriage load of men in what is, I think we'll have to agree, one of the most awful cases of road rage ever recorded. Um, he then reached Thebes, uh, where he was made king, uh, which is quite ironic, ironic really, um, given, given that he's not very good with oracles, because he'd actually managed to solve the riddle of the Sphinx. And the riddle runs, what goes on four legs in the morning, three in the afternoon, and two at night? And I remember this, I, I, I had this riddle put to me for the first time when I was, I think, 17 at school, and I had absolutely no idea how to answer this. And I so I thought about it for a while, I was really put on the spot, and I said a drunk, and then my teacher sort of cast sort of a, a strange look at me, because I was thinking, you know, sort of crawling along, or whatever, but that was the wrong answer, the right answer was actually uh, humans, because only, only humans uh, crawl at birth, walk on two legs uh, in their adulthood, and then sort of on, on three by holding a cane in their dotage. So somehow Oedipus managed to get that right. Another prize for getting that right was that Oedipus won as his wife, um, Jocasta. And it was only many years later, after having four children with her, that he discovered that she was actually his real mother and that one of the men he'd killed at the crossroads was in fact his natural father. 
the Greeks had a special word for this moment of dire realization and reversal in fortunes. They called it the peripatia. Uh, and it really marked the turning point of the play, the moment that marked the shift between uh, the moment where so things have gone all right or quite well for a character to the moment where they start to go really devastatingly wrong. Uh, and Aristotle wrote a lot about um, peripatia in Greek theatre, and he thought the one in, in Oedipus Rex was particularly wonderful. Um, it's a very, very dramatic reversal of fortunes. Uh, what really makes this Greek drama, I think, so exciting is sort of underlying the place is the idea that anyone's fortune can change. You're looking at Oedipuses in particular, but really this happens to anyone. It could be, it just happen in the blink of an eye. Um, it may even have been sort of written down your fate before your own birth. You just don't know. There's no way of knowing until you get to that moment. And as the audience, we're brought right up close to that character as they undergo that really terrible transition from one way of life to another. And I think that's sort of one of the, the the most powerful elements of, of Greek tragedy is, is being able to watch that person and how they react and how they deal with that moment as they flip from one to the other. And often, as I say, it's very hard to know where to place your sympathies uh, in, that, in that moment. I think particularly where female characters are concerned. Um, many of them are victims who manage to sort of shed their, their status of, as victims, but they often do so by uh, committing some really terrible crimes sort of in, in the process. Um, so a, a good example of this is if you consider Aeschylus's Agamemnon, which is the first in a trilogy, our only surviving trilogy of plays, of, of tragedies from uh, ancient Greece. And uh, Clytemnestra in this play, she murders her husband Agamemnon because uh, sort of a, a long series of events, but going back in time, he's actually killed their daughter. He was the leader of the Greek army in the Trojan War. We meet him obviously a lot in, in Homer's Iliad. Uh, and he's returned home from the war and he's brought with him a, tr a Trojan princess as his concubine. Um, so it's not a good start when he's coming home to his wife. Clytemnestra, she's now confronted by a husband who's both uh, a murderer of their daughter as she sees it um, and an adulterer. And she calls him the darling of each courtesan at Troy. Although Clytemnestra has actually taken a lover herself in her husband's absence, she cannot live with this man, with Agamemnon, any longer. She's still a grieving mother, and so she brutally hacks him down. With moments like this, we wouldn't have actually seen this on the stage in Greek theatre. Murder itself is never shown on the stage, but what we do hear are the cries of the you know, blood curdling cries from, from off stage uh, of the victim as they undergo uh, whatever's happening. So the audience instead at this moment, they'd have seen Clytemnestra really glorying in her sort of bloodthirstiness and in her bloodthirsty act. She speaks in the play of the sombre drizzle of bloody dew and rejoices in it. Again, I quote, no less than in God's gift of rain. So it's quite sort of, you know, uncomfortable uh, with, with that, but you, at the same time, you just are not quite sure where your sympathies lie in this play. Uh, Aeschylus's Greek is often said to be quite difficult to translate. It's very stately. Um, the comedian Aristophanes uh, in the same period, he had Euripides actually mock Aeschylus's language in a play in the frogs he describes it as full of, of words as big as oxes and beyond the comprehension of, of, of sort of you know your everyday person but when you sit down and actually read it closely it's, it's not quite as bad as, as Euripides is making out um, in the 1930s one of my favorite uh, poets Louis McNeese my sort of favorite modern poet I should say he he captured it really well I think the sort of the stateliness of Aeschylus's Greek where he described how Agamemnon quote carelessly as if it were a head of sheep out of abundance of his fleecy flocks sacrificed his own daughter to secure a favorable wind for his fleet to Troy now Agamemnon being murdered he's had his just desserts for that act um literally 
I say just desserts because he's actually also playing the paying the price of, of a terrible family curse of his own. His father had actually killed his nephews and served them to their unwitting father for dinner uh, in a stew. So this sort of bad luck again runs in the family. The play itself by Aeschylus actually revolves around the change of fortune, this peripatia we're talking about, of, of Agamemnon that he must undergo from war hero to murder victim. Um, but even though he's the centre of this, in many ways, Clytemnestra, his wife, she's the one who has the leading role. She speaks far more lines than Agamemnon in this play, and she's a lot more developed as a character. I think we feel like she's a lot more sort of well-rounded. We get to know her a lot better than we do Agamemnon. And this is quite common in Greek tragedy. Uh, women are often placed at the very forefront of events. People have looked at this in different ways and tried to explain why this might be the case. And some people see it as an attempt on the part of the male playwrights to try and sort of liberate women or to try and champion women in their own time. Others see it more as sort of to a certain extent reflecting reality, which is I think to me is quite strange because in ancient Athens at least, women um, really didn't have many rights at all. They didn't have the votes, they didn't really have political rights, they didn't really have a public voice as such at all. So I think really it's more of an experiment I think with male playwrights, they were using their plays to try and present their kind of version or their ideas of what might happen if women really did have the same rights and powers as men. What would they have done? I think that's kind of what these plays are about. Um, and a lot of these plays, these, these Greek tragedies show that this is a terrifying, frightening prospect. I mean, the, the, the idea that women should have these, if, if they did have the same powers as men, what they would do, the world, itself kind of becomes absolutely terrifying as a result of that. We have sort of, you know, Phyder we've met earlier, falsely accusing her stepson of rape, Clytemnestra being a murderess, um, Medea, another famous example, killing her own children to spite um, their father because he cheated on her. So I think to me, this speaks very volubly of men's fears of women in the fifth century BC. I think it says quite a lot about how, how they viewed women and sort of their, their potential and sort of maybe perpetuating the ideas of trying to keep women in their place. What's interesting to note is actually that Euripides was accused of being a misogynist in his own time. We have a Greek comedy by Aristophanes, who's really the leading comedian in this period. And he has in his play, he has a group of women actually rise up against Euripides and accuse him of portraying them as such sort of beastly people in his plays. And it's, it's very, very farcical. There are sort of these ridiculous scenes where Euripides dresses up uh, his father-in-law as a woman so that he can actually infiltrate the women's meeting and try and find out what they're plotting against him, what they're saying about him. Um, but the father-in-law father goes along to these meetings and uh, he starts spouting all this nonsense about women, saying some really terrible things about women himself. So the women themselves become really, really suspicious of who this person is and they're not quite sure uh, you know, they haven't met him before or her before. So they decide to strip him the female clothes and there's sort of these really fast square episodes where he's trying to hide his um equipment shall we say i've seen this actually performed on stage using balloons it's <laughs> quite funny um so it doesn't really sort of end well uh, in, in that respect but i'd actually say that of all the playwrights um euripides actually encouraged his audience to empathize the most i think with the plights of his female characters they, they speak for themselves um, and they're given surprisingly persuasive arguments as to why they act the way they do and why their actions are justified. And I think maybe this is what made Euripides so suspect. I've said earlier on that he was less popular in his own time uh, than, than his sort of slightly older contemporaries. He unnerved his audiences, I think, by persuading them that the most unthinkable action could sometimes be the only action and actually the right action in a certain set of circumstances. And that was terrifying, I think, to behold and to realize. It's really, it's part of the magic of Greek tragedy that you can find yourself swinging from empathy one moment to disgust the next and then back again. That's part of the journey that the, the Greek tragedy takes us on. And I think that's something that Euripides exploits really uh, to, to its full.
We become, as an audience, really morally invested in these characters. Uh, yes, their actions may be absolutely appalling, but so are their predicaments, uh, predicaments um, that the, the playwrights place them in. These playwrights, they wanted us to put ourselves in the shoes of their characters and ask whether we would have acted any differently given the scenario. What would it take for us to go just that little bit too far? Greek tragedy, it really shows us that the line between reason and the loss of reason is incredibly easily crossed. Um, it shows us that really it's, 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 it's human to, to strive for justice and it's, it's human and only to right to strive for life. The nurse, I think, in Euripides, Hippolytus, uh, she, she may be a traitor by revealing the secret, but she seems to sum things up um, very well when she says, again, I'll read uh, from the translation, that we humans seem disastrously in love with this thing, whatever it is that glitters on the earth. We call it life. We know no other. The underworlds are blank and all the rest just fantasy. And that just seems so incredibly modern, I think. Um, it's a wonderful line. I think if tragedy teaches you one thing, it is to seize life by both horns, just like the Minotaur, because you never know what's being cooked up for you in the theatre that we call life. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Daisy, for such a wonderful evocation of Greek tragedy and the various playwrights that we have, Aeschylus all the way to Aristophanes. It's really been uh, a very engaging and wonderful talk, especially to hear such readings from various authors throughout the ages. It's been absolutely wonderful. Uh, for our audience, um, please feel free to use the Q&A function. Uh, we're going to have, have a short break, uh, five minutes, uh, so pop your questions in there. Uh, in the meantime, Daisy, um, do you have any favourite tragedies or, or comedies, uh, if we're including all the Greek theatre? Do you have any specific ones? Uh... Gosh, so many. I mean, I, I absolutely love the Medea because I think it was one of the first ones that I, I read and I was, I think, true to form, like really quite shocked by it. I mean, the fact that any woman could kill her two offspring and do thing, do it in such a sort of brazen way and feel like she was entirely justified and sort of put her case of being justified so openly. That really surprised me and I sort of again I had this sort of whole sort of tussle about who do I feel sorry for I mean yes her husband's behaved really really badly but then you feel sorry for his new wife that he has in this play who sort of sent this sort of poisoned gown and, and diadem and she's you know d dies this really awful death because of Medea wanting to take vengeance so that really yeah certainly captured my imagination when I was sort of first discovering uh, Greek tragedy I think I was I was at school, I was about 17 when I started sort of reading some of these plays and I was, they were unlike anything I'd sort of read before. Um, and I just think they have that effect immediately. Um, one of the things that gets picked up quite often when we talk about Greek tragedy is Aristotle's poetics. And obviously he's coming in from a very philosophical, scientific point of view and he quite rigidly defines what a tragedy is and what is good for a tragedy to, to pursue. And he talks about pity and fear and the peripatia, reversal of fortune and the sequence of events and timings. Do you, do you agree with his measures of what a good tragedy is? I think I do, by and large. I think Aristotle sort of had it, had it down pretty well. I mean, I think another thing he talks about really well, I think, which sort of resonate with us a lot is catharsis. And so the cathartic experience of, of seeing something like of someone's sort of life rolled out and then sort of going through it with them and feeling this sort of sense of release at the end instead of seeing how these events sort of come to pass and I think you know Aristotle is sort of a really interesting source on these I think the poetics is probably not the first text I'd recommend for someone you know wanting to get into Greek theatre to explore but when you've read a few of them it's really really interesting uh, work to sort of look at and to see how it was kind of studied critically. Um, and of course your book A uh, Hundred Stories uh, of God and Men um, it's often it's about reception studies and I think one of the um, perhaps our uh, audience might be slightly young but obviously in 2004 we had Wolfgang Peterson's Troy uh, which many historians uh, sort of cried out in anger about the many uh, inaccuracies from that uh, 
I believe Menelaus is killed within uh, that that film. Um, do you think it's appropriate for people to uh, adjust to these myths and stories quite so heavily and sort of, sort of uh, maneuver away from the source material? It's a really difficult question. I think it's, it's one that's sort of raging a lot. I think we've seen in the press recently a lot about the crown. You know, should we look at the crown? People are saying, oh, it should come with a warning that it's not history, that it's drama, but it's kind of based on events that have happened. And I think, you know, my viewpoint on that is I'm not a huge crown fan, I have to say. But um, I think if as long as people are aware that there is a sort of a, a difference. You know, I, 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 I like people picking up classical works and making Hollywood blockbusters from them because it brings a load more people to the subject who might not have, you know, had any interest in sort of any way in of, of, of seeing these works, you know. But at the same time, it's a double-edged sword in a way. If you look at the film Troy and you think, oh goodness, this is the way that this is, this is Homer. Obviously it's not Homer, but you have to, I just sort of encourage anyone, if you're looking at an engagement to then go back to the original source and compare them, make your mind, your own mind up about this. And like, you know, what would you have done differently? I sort of often ask myself this, what would I have done differently if I was re reinterpreting this today? But I think it's part of the process that, that keeps it fresh. I mean, I, I, I often say things like, if you look at myth itself was a very fluid thing in the ancient world. Myths were constantly changing. Storytelling was one of those things that was passed down generations and people you know, telling their, their children different stories. They were passed down families, they were passed down through various people and they changed naturally as part of that process. So there is a sort of certain element of fluidity involved. So on balance, I'm, I'm in favor rather than against these reinterpretations. Uh, another question from uh, Will Gray. When it came to the masks, would they have been changed off stage or would they have held different ones depending on the characters that they were portraying at that time? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't think we know for certain, but my impression is that there, there was a, a changing area actually on the stage behind a screen. So my interpretation would be that they'd, they'd be changing their mask behind that screen before coming on as someone else. And I think that's important when there are so many different characters that these people are playing. You know, there, there would have been a, a certain amount of costume changing involved like very rapidly um, when you're looking. I mean, that, that's, that's something really surprised me. I think when I first started, started studying tragedy, I had no idea that they'd have just three actors. It seems really incomprehensible. I think when we're used to going to the theater today and seeing great productions, like the idea of having all these parts played by just a, a few different people is quite surprising. It really is an alien concept, having you know the same actor playing a variety of different characters. Um, a question, uh, what Greek comedy would you recommend as the first one to read? Ooh, uh, first comedy to read. I, I like The Frogs by Aristophanes. That's very, very funny. And it has the, the line that people We'll always quote to you the Breca Kekex, Coax, Coax, all the way through it. These sort of very funny, um, sort of onomatopoeic lines throughout. Uh, I like that one. Um, there's, there's so many. I mean, we've got about 11 of, of Aristophanes comedies. Um, the Clouds is another very good one. Or the, yeah, the, the Clouds of the sort of Cloud Cookie Land. It, very, very funny. Um, and I think Aristophanes is definitely the, the place to start when it comes to ancient comedy. Uh, I was quite surprised just how much phallic and scatological humour there was chucked in with the with uh, ancient comedies. <laughs> there is, I say it's not for the, you can't be clutching your pearls, I think, when you, when you sit down to, <laughs> to read Aristophanes for the first time. And I think a lot of, I remember sort of reading this with, with some friends and lots of people saying, this really isn't funny. It's not really my sort of sense of humour. And I think, what is funny now and what was funny then, they're not necessarily the same. I think, you know, there's a sort of element of wit. There's, there are bits which are occasionally sort of laugh out loud funny, but it's, it is a slightly different <laughs> type of humour maybe mm. than what we're used to today. Um, do you think that Clytemnestra's motivation is her husband's adultery and murder mm -hmm. of their daughter, or is she just an agent of the God's punishment of Agamemnon for the atrocities committed during the Trojan War? Does Clytemnestra have her own autonomy in that sense? What a great question. Um, I think it is partly sort of intended for us to ask that question and to decide. I think with Clytemnestra, I think the way that she's presented by Aeschylus, he 
I, I get the impression that he wants us to see her as having a degree of autonomy because the way that she's she's so sort of powerfully characterized you know she seems so, a woman of, of such strong conviction and I, I think that he wouldn't want to sort of take away all of her responsibility and her culpability for what she does I think we're meant to see her as being responsible in part even if she's kind of falling in with with the fate that the god wants uh, to see carried out I certainly agree with that especially if we just look solely at um Aeschylus's portrayal and you know a huge problem with myths is that there's just so many and they sort of get combined and other myths talk about the various punishments that the Greek heroes receive after treating all the temples so poorly in in Troy so it's difficult to, to sort of pick one out and really say this is what happened. Mm. Uh, a question from Dawn, uh, do you think the main function for tragedy was to allow for catharsis or to challenge the morals and ideals of that society? Well, I think we're sort of going back to sort of Aristotle, catharsis was a major part of it. But I, I see so much of, of Greek tragedy as being sort of trying to serve to sort of challenge the status quo and to present things in a completely different way from sort of how, how things sat, but at the same time offer a kind of a, a veneer, a, a way of, of balancing and, and sort of measuring and, and reinterpreting how, how we live our lives, but in a kind of, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's enacted in a, in a different realm. So it's, it's purposely placed in a realm which is significantly different from our everyday life, that we can then still see it being um, enacted in that weird realm, but then it seems so far away from us, but then at the same time, because it's so far away, we can kind of apply it to our own sort of life. Does that make sense? That sounds very garbled, but what I, <laughs> what I, what I mean is I think that he's intentionally, all these, all these players are trying to sort of make us question um, particularly those sort of original audience question why things are the way they are and what what would really happen if they were allowed to sort of play out in the opposite way from the way they do say with women for example given um, equal power to to men how would society look like what what would it take for our society to look um, different from from the way it is it is very it's incredibly difficult to define what catharsis is you know we're, we're separated by how many thousands of years and you know people do, uh, sort of define it as sort of um a, a expulsion of polluted emotions and this sort of cleansing sense that you get from it um and when you're talking about ideals of bestiality and incest it, it's quite hard to, to really get a hold of it. it's a very great question from it, that it's was. really difficult and I, I say another point we mentioned earlier so edith hall wrote a book um a fairly a few years ago, um, it's Aristotle's way of thinking. She, she kind of likens catharsis to people sort of watching like a, a like a weepy movie today, and people getting round together. She sort of talks about women getting together uh, one evening, with, you know, with with wine and popcorn, and then just crying their eyes out because they actually quite enjoy the process of crying their eyes out watching this really really sad film. And that's her sort of mode of comparison for catharsis, which I thought was quite interesting. Uh, more on the sort of physical aspect of theatre. Uh, what sort of instruments were played in, in the orchestra of Greek theatre and comedy? Well, it was a mixture of different, of different instruments. So I think a lot of them were kind of more drum based. So we're looking at percussion rather than um, sort of, I think when we're looking at, particularly when we're going back into sort of ancient poetry, we look more at kind of the lyre, for example, which could have a part. But with this, we're looking particularly at sort of more percussive, like lots of sort of beating of, of tambourines and, and drum type instruments. Um, and I think that was sort of particularly key when you've got with with kind of Dionysus and all his sort of noisy entourage, particularly in the back, you, you've got the sort of idea of all these people pouring in. And I think often when they're in a reinterpreted in sort of 16th century art, you just sort of see lots of, of symbols, for example, as well, being being played as, as part of sort of the idea of, of the noise of, of Dionysus. And that kind of goes to the idea of this procession, which is part of the great um, Dionysia itself. Okay, I think we're going to wrap up with, I think, three more questions. Um, the first one from Josh Streeter. Uh, what seems to, to you to be the significant differences between theatre as the Greeks knew it and as theatre we know today? And what are the significant similarities, perhaps in, in regards to the sort of civic duties of, of ancient theatre? I'd say that um, there's a sort of more overt um, more sort of moralizing crusade in a lot of of ancient ancient theater um I, 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 obviously we see that in sort of certain modern plays as well but i think there is a kind of a clear 
moral message that comes out of of ancient plays and which is sort of intended to be applied to you know to the, the city state and sort of one's um some obligations you know to to each other um and to the state itself and i think we, that's something we don't really find uh, so much in uh you know our, our kind of typical theater today but i think the whole sort of setup of of greek theater is quite different um you know it, it seems very uh, at odds i think when we look at you know people wearing these masks and people wearing wigs and sort of having expression purely through sort of a painted form rather than sort of one's facial features that's, which is so much as sort of a part of acting today is looking what you're doing with your face and like the idea of having your face completely covered to me like seems very very different that, that seems sort of uh, if, again it kind of almost puts a wall between you and the character whereas I think when you're on stage today particularly in a kind of more intimate setting um you're you know trying to empathize uh, as closely as possible with with an actor by by you're looking at them you're within sort of touching distance of them and that's quite important, I think, to a lot of sort of modern productions, and that really wasn't there so much in, in ancient theatre. Um, I think we can all agree that many of these plays from the ancient world do resonate with some problems we have in the modern world. Um, but how do you think young people who are passionate about these Greek myths and Greek tragedies, how can they realistically pursue the study of it? How, how would you recommend someone um, sort of pursue study of it if they don't offer it at their school? Well, I'd say a really good thing is uh, to begin by uh, just buy like a, a paperback with, um, you can get sort of maybe four of the tragedies in a small paperback and just give that a read. And I really like uh, what I, sort of, I remember doing when I was young, sort of acting out different parts with friends and just sort of reading them out. Because I think they're, they're things, they're not necessary to be sort of enjoyed on your own. I think it's really nice to read these things aloud. And I say that a lot about ancient literature in general in translation, I think so much of it is written to be read and written to be heard. That, you know, that oral culture is a huge part, obviously through Homer, but it, that lives on through through tragedy as well. So I think my sort of advice to anyone who's wanting to, to look at this is, is not don't just sort of sit there in silence with your book, but you know, buy a book and then read it aloud and read it with with someone. If you can find someone who's willing to to take part with you, um, I think that's just it, it's important to kind of get a sense of the, the sound um, of it as well. Mm -hmm. You know, the, these uh, plays are written in a, like a meter. So they are meant to be sounded out uh, aloud. And that is often something that we forget. Um, next week, we're gonna hear from uh, the American scholar, Jeff Wright, about orality and how we sometimes overlook it in the modern world. So, so look forward to that if you're interested. Uh, and there's one final question to, to end the evening on from Carl. Uh, did the Greek tra uh, tragedians have a concept of justice beyond whatever you do, don't dishonor the gods? And I think this picks up on like the old classic question of what, uh, I, believe, I believe it's Timna, in, in ancient Greek, what, what really that is? This is a really difficult question. So, so Timo talking about honour as well. It's not just, I think, to do with um, honouring the gods. It's to do with your own sense of, of achievement and purpose in life. And this is something sort of is very much at the heart of Homer and it carries on. There's a sort of sense that you need to achieve enough in yourself to make yourself proud. So in, in, in Homer, um, people, all these soldiers, for example, they, they talk of Kleos, they talk of this desire for an, an immortal reputation. They want to do enough in their lives that they will be remembered forever after. And it's a way of trying to overcome uh, the shortness of human life. And I think that becomes sort of quite a resonant message in, in Greek tragedy as well. You know, a lot of these people will be remembered for doing the wrong things, but you, it's much better to be remembered for doing the right things. And that's part of overstepping the boundaries of mortality. It's, a, it's part of, of your own sort of sense of honour, but also your sense of achievement in the eyes of other people. And that really mattered in the Greek world, the way that you were perceived by other people and the way that you remembered by other people. If you could be remembered and thought of and spoken of in, you know, really, really towering, a towering way um, after, you died you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, 100 years later, then you've really achieved something. And that is, I think, what they're trying to do a lot of the time in tragedy. It's not just about being good and honoring the gods and obeying the gods. It's about um, sort of making the most of, of, of yourself and trying to 
we'd probably say you know reach your potential but for the Greeks it's more than that it's, it's much more about sort of how you're, you're seen and how you're remembered thereafter. Um, I know I said that was the final question but I've got one of my own following on from that concept of justice uh, do you think that Clytemnestra or, or Orestes for that matter uh, are they justified in in their either pa um, matricide or or killing their husband are, are, can you justify them? It's, it's a really horrible question, isn't it? <laughs> because you don't want to say, if you say yes, you look like you're endorsing a murder. But I mean, I don't think I can endorse. I, I don't think Clytemnest is justified. I mean, I think what we'd rather see, I think, if you're a sort of, particularly if you're a woman looking back, I mean, you completely understand her position. Like she's lost her daughter, she's seen her husband come home and, you know, not being particularly honourable towards her. You can understand why she'd want to do it, absolutely. But I think what you'd want to see is her take a kind of a, a sweeter form of revenge and try and, you know, try and diminish his war record in some other way. I think that would have been more satisfying, I think, to you as, as, a, as a modern as a modern reader or viewer. Um, it'd be nice to see what, what else could she have done to really get at her husband in a way that's going to bruise him. And I think that would have been through you know, doing something, calling into question, for example, his bravery uh, in battle or doing something to his reputation. Um, I think that would have been sort of more satisfying, almost like killing him looks looks easy by mm. comparison. Well, I think we're going to end the evening on that note. Uh, Daisy, thank you so much for uh, coming on to speak with us. It really is a pleasure and an honor for you to, to answer our questions and come talk with us this evening. Um, if anyone has any other further questions, uh, do you just drop us a message on social media or by email and hopefully you can get them answered later on. And we have just on the screen sharing there, uh, Daisy's book of Gods and Men, a hundred stories from ancient Greece and Rome. It really is fantastic. Uh, a great way to look at the various ways and cultures and societies that have translated these myths and stories. And it is fantastic to see such random people you wouldn't have expected to translate things from the ancient world. As you said before, um, Queen Elizabeth I, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh, uh, a myriad of people. Oh, thank you very much. Well, thank you for, for having me as well. I hope, um, I hope you